uh, watching what um, Startup Bootcamp uh, has put together here and what the uh, investment community has supported is just world-class, spectacular. It's as good as anything I've seen. Um, and, um, so I'm basically going to tell most of you what you already know because you're practicing it here. Um, and I'm just going to share with you some of the theory. Though for those of you who are the entrepreneurs, you're living this. And for the investors, uh, you know, you're funding this. So this might be redundant and you could either go to sleep or check your mail or anything else. Uh, but the startup boot camp process, really for investors, you should think about what we now have learned. Over the last five years, we've learned how to crack the entrepreneurial code. We now know across a portfolio of startups how to make startups fail less. That's a big deal. We now know how essentially to increase the IRR across a portfolio versus a standard random group. And I think the startup bootcamp process that's been put together does just that. So I'm going to tell you some of the theory about how to fail less around two ideas called business model design and customer development. And I'm going to do this just by telling you what we used to believe in the last century of entrepreneurship and now what we now know. And what we used to believe is the distinction between search and execution. We used to believe that startups are smaller versions of large companies. When Silicon Valley first received its professional investors, their backgrounds were either business people with MBAs or financiers with financial degrees. They took everything they knew from growing and managing large corporations and applied them to early stage ventures. They said, startups, how hard could that be? I used to invest or manage companies with 10, 100,000 people. These are two guys in a garage. I get it. Everything we've done in large corporations, we're going to do and manage the same way for startups. So the methodology for the first 50 years in Silicon Valley was you're a smaller version of a large company. What we now know is that's simply not true. And the distinction can be boiled down into two sentences. Startups search for a repeatable and scalable business model. But large corporations execute known models. We've seen pieces of this. We understand that startup entrepreneurs are not the same as Fortune 1000 CEOs. We've seen the exact opposite. You throw a Fortune 1000 CEO into an early stage venture, and they wouldn't know how to dial the phone without a staff. I had one of those, actually. Um, we've also seen that the amount of planning and meeting and committees and whatever that make a large company run efficiently actually turns a startup into a completely inefficient organization. Yet we've seen entrepreneurs who could get on the airplane on the drop of a phone call, do something different on Monday, different something, something different on Wednesday, and we knew instinctually that, we were that they were different. We just didn't understand how. What we used to believe for startup strategy was that all we need to do is execute the plan. Any of you write one of these in your lives? Yeah. We don't do this anymore in Silicon Valley. Uh, because what we now know is we actually have an actual photo of what happens when a business plan has first contact with customers. It, it, it looks like this. Uh, uh, because, um, and by the way, what we used to believe is Appendix A in the back of the plan. Right? Anybody ever have to do the Appendix A five-year forecast? No one ever made the comparison that the only other people requiring five-year plans were these guys. And we know how well this turned out. Now, and, and I want you to notice that the people who are not applauding are the people in the first row who are the investors. Uh, 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 because in fact, well, let me explain, is that what we used to feel comfortable with is these were the tools we learned how to manage execution. Gee, I understand I need an income statement, I need a balance sheet, I need a cash flow, I need a forecast. How can I not manage your investment? It's asymmetrical information. I need to sit on your board. I need to see what you guys are claiming to do. Well, on the other hand, on this side of the room, we kind of understand that while business plans might still be taught in universities, in the States, we now agree that they ought to be taught in the English department because they're the best example of creative writing anybody will ever do. Again, only one half of the room is laughing. Um, 
So what we now know is, Steve, okay, we get it. You don't like business plans. You don't like five-year forecasts. How can you run a business without them? And I just want to make clear, I am not suggesting we don't ever need them. Big idea. What I am suggesting is they are operating documents for execution. And so what we really need to do is think about what goes before those execution documents. What is it that we ought to have startups be writing and doing and thinking about? And as I said, we now know no business plan survives first contact with customers, so we want to put planning before the plan. It's not that I don't want an execution document. I just want you to do some of the planning. And we've been seeing here in Startup Boot Camp that excellent type of planning. We've been getting out of the building and doing that. And the way we teach it is there are two components of that. One is that there was a guy named Alexander Osterwalder who wrote a book called Business Model Generation. Anybody read it or see it? It should be on all your desks if you're an entrepreneur. Osterwalder said something pretty simple. He said, look, for the last 20 years, academics have been arguing about the word business model. You get three academics in a room, you could get nine definitions and a 14-page thesis on how to order lunch. Um, but, but really, the, the key thing about this business model is that he said, even an entrepreneur could understand that. There's nine boxes, all you need to worry about. What's your value proposition, fancy name for what's your product and service, who are the customers, what's your sales channels, how do you get and keep and grow customers, revenue streams, resources, activities, partners, and cost structure. And we'll see how we use this to do planning. So we believe that before you start writing operating plans, you need to articulate and then test hypotheses about your entire business. And then you get to do execution. Then, after you've tested them, instead of creative writing, you're now actually writing down something that are based on some data. What we used to believe for process is we built startups by managing processes. We hired product management, we did waterfall engineering, and boom, you know, at the end of that process, version 1.0 would come out and everything would work perfect, ex exactly like the plan. And in fact, if you used to draw this diagram, concepts, seed round, product development, alpha test, beta test, first customer ship, your board would high five you. They'd go, yeah, that's it. Because you'd hire marketing, and marketing got to do the best job they ever were hired for, which was to throw the world's best party at first customer ship. That was marketing's job. Uh, essentially to create demand, but you got you know, the CEO's picture on a blog or a newspaper, they were excited, your board was excited because they got to show it to the rest of their partners. Um, you got to hire sales, and of course a sales VP, their only job is to hire more sales people. Um, and uh, because the sales VP uh, never got the memo, they never quite understood that their half-life is between 9 and 15 months as the first VP of sales because what happens at first customer ship is you'd make the plan and everybody would be happy and you're high-fiving each other and have the next board meeting and finally people would turn around to the head of sales and say, how are we doing? And the head of sales would say, great pipeline. <laughs> now only this half is laughing, right? Great pipeline means there's no orders, but it's looking good and I'm hoping you're not really asking. And, the, <laughs> and depending on the economic conditions, you know, you get to have that board meeting, um, you know, one to end more times. Uh, but eventually you open that boardroom door and for some reason, no one is sitting next to the VP of sales anymore. <laughs> and you smell and there's a stench of death in the room. <laughs> because there's a flaming sword over her head. And the minute she says, pipeline, poof, she, and there's someone else sitting there. Now, how we used to solve failure of strategy problems, and some companies still do, is by firing executives. We assumed that the plan was inviolate. We wrote it down, our VCs gave us money for it, so therefore, everybody must be geniuses in the process. And if there's a failure, it must be a failure of an individual. We now know, excuse the technical term, but that's bullshit. After 50 years, we know that's not the case. We know startups don't go from success to success. And while these presentations here look pretty, startups actually go from failure to failure. And it's actually that learning from that failure and that quick set of iterations and pivots mean that the most efficient way to build startups are not firing the executives first, it's firing the plan first. 
This product introduction model makes all the sense in the world in a large company. This is the world's worst way to build products in a startup. Right? Because then we used to engineering, used to do waterfall, you'd spec the entire product on day one. And if you spec the entire product on day one, it assumes somehow you have telepathy because not only did you telepathically understand the customer problem in its entirety sitting in your building, you were capable of specking every possible feature that might be needed. And you wrote them all down and you argued about them and then boom, you went to work and started building them. And it's only after you shipped that you realize that 90 to 95 percent of those features were unneeded and unwanted by customers enormous amount of waste, time, money, and energy. What we now know is we don't do that anymore. After 50 years of venture capital, we kind of have recognized that still, even in Silicon Valley, 90% of startups in a portfolio fail. Now, you know the only other people who have worse numbers? Anybody know what other industry has worse, worse numbers? After 100 years in the United States, Hollywood makes on the average of four to 500 commercial movies a year. We're not talking about YouTube videos, we're talking about commercial movies. Five to seven percent of them make money. Now we're talking about people who actually been making movies for a hundred years. It's a hits-based business. Guess what? You're in one as well. And all we're trying to do is help you increase the odds of success. And so, the key point of why you fail is that most startups fail from a lack of customers, not that none of you are going to deliver your technology. Don't feel comfortable because you'll never deliver on time. It's not that your technology is not going to work. It's in fact, you guessed wrong about customer needs. I mean, it was great and here's our partners and whatever. Let's see if you find 50 more of those right, at a profitable pace. That's why startups fail. And so what we really want is to couple a process so we could do rapid search of that customer and market space as quickly as possible. And so about 10 years ago, I wrote a book called The Four Steps of the Epiphany, which was essentially a search strategy for early stage startups. And it says, look, on day one, when you start, I don't care how pretty your PowerPoints are and how great we've taught you how to present, what you have is a faith-based enterprise. You're starting on faith. You have very little facts in your company. Your job is as quickly as possible to turn all that faith, all those hypotheses, into facts. And there are no facts inside your building. None. Maybe, you know, whether the light switch works. But that's about it. What we need to do is rapidly iterate and test. And so we're going to do that with something called customer and agile development. And then when we find the truth, then we get to hire product managers, and then we get to manage this as a large company. The last piece is organization. Now, when I was a startup CEO, my dream of an org chart was I was going to build a great functional organization that would be me and the head of sales and head of engineering, and it was going to look like this in week three. Some of you are already drawing these, you know, etc. The biggest surprise was this is also probably the world's worst possible thing to do. And this one is really hard. Because wait a minute, what, what do you mean I, I don't want this org chart? Well, let's think about this for a second. Anybody ever hire a VP of sales from a large corporation? Right? What happened? Why? Were they idiots? No. But they, most large corporate execs crater in their first startup. There's a rule of thumb Again, in Silicon Valley, I'm sure you guys have it as well, that says you want to be the second startup to hire that large company exec. And the reason why now is pretty simple. Large company executives, and here's the tricky part, their title is the same, right? It's VP of sales. How hard could that be? I want a VP of sales. Large company executives, their job spec is execution. The job has already been specified. What they do is known. Sales, hire more people, here's who we call on, here's the price list, the product sheets, the presentations, etc. Hire more salespeople, make these numbers grow. Of course, I'm simplifying, but that's an execution job. VP of marketing, we got it. Here's who our customer segment is, do we have better ads, better acquisition strategies, etc. We know what the job is. Let me tell you, if you know what the job is, you don't need to be here, right? You should just get a bank loan. 
Maybe you do need to be here if you want a bank loan. But in, in, in any case, we confuse people with world-class execution skills and then throw them into a startup and say, oh, customers, we don't know, go figure it out. Well, people whose skills are execution almost always do not have go figure it out skills because they tend to migrate to places where they are world class in execution. And this disconnect was because the titles are the same. The other piece I want to tell you, we're going to do a little exercise, 30 seconds. Who's the CEO? <laughs> All right, hire a VP of sales. Do you have a VP of sales here? Great, go out and talk to some customers. Ask them if they like your product. Go out and go. Yeah, hate it. All right, ask a couple more. Hate it, hate it, hate it. Great. Tell your CEO. No, no, yeah, right. Yeah. That's the going out of business statement, by the way, but it, but it happens. All right, what's your first reaction? Yeah, it's great to hear. No, no, no. When he actually tells you the truth, what's your first reaction? The truth was just that uh, everybody said they loved it. No, that they hated it. Oh, they hated it? Yeah. What's your first reaction? Yeah. And by the way, you're just not explaining it right because I'm the founder. You know, how can it be wrong? Right. It's just sent you out. It's my idea. It's, it has to, has to be brilliant. Ask a couple more people. Yeah, it sucks. OK, tell them it sucks now. Tell them it sucks. what's your second reaction? You're fired. All right. We set our watch. All right. Anybody ever see this in real world? OK. Now, if you're doing it my way. You're not allowed to hire a VP of sales first, okay? Get out and ask the customers. Go out and ask them. <laughs> Go ahead, tell them. It sucks. No, it sucks. Now, what can you do as, wait a minute, time out. What can you do as CEO that the VP of sales could not? What could you do? You bet. An employee has no authority to pivot the company. The founder in real time hearing cognitive dissonance with smoke coming out of their ears. And by the way, it doesn't happen the first time because, by the way, your first reaction as the CEO, they're idiots. They just don't get it either. But after you personally have to hear this two, five, took me about 43 times myself because I didn't believe, you know, people could not love my idea. You, you have nowhere else to go. You mentally have to deal with this now. And you have the authority to deal with this now. Having sales executives in between you and customers before you have found a repeatable and scalable business model is, a, due respect, a going out of business strategy. He's superfluous now. Now, he probably could do some other stuff for your company, like opening doors. You need to be hearing. <laughs> All right. You need to be hearing. Customer feedback now with no other intermediaries. My two cents. So what we now know is that founders run a customer development team. No sales and marketing and biz dev until you find a repeatable and scalable model. It doesn't mean we're not going to have those people. Of course we're going to have those people. You have a job just a little later. Um, so what we want is a customer development team. And then we want to build the traditional functional organization. And by the way, um, I stuck this slide in here because I find out that even in Europe, um, entrepreneurs don't get the secret memo from the VCs. And because I thought I'd have both of you sitting here, I thought I'd expose the secret memo that you guys will never get, but they actually have in their back pocket. You want to know what it is? All right, the secret memo says, if you're a scalable startup and you're searching for a business model and one day you find it, you have found that orders just keep coming in. You do X and orders come out and you do X again and orders come out. You're excited as heck, right? You're a winner. In fact, you're so excited for the next board meeting, you're clearing the aisles in your company. So the parade, you know, that will go up and down the aisles and you're actually handing out confetti to your employees. So when the VCs march you down and you're thinking, where should they pin the medal and give you the bonus? Actually, what happens? Anybody ever been through this board meeting? Hey, man, I'm going to show you what actually happens. They're going to cringe because I'm going to tell you the secret VC secret. You're going to announce we have found a repeatable and scalable model. And the VCs are going to start looking at you in a way that's personally uncomfortable. <laughs> 
I mean, they're looking at you, and, and you're, th you're like, seeing if your fly is zipped up. I mean, you don't quite understand. <laughs> you know, like, are you being hit on? What, what the heck's going on here? What do you think's happening? Why? You bet. You bet. And this explains all of these horror stories that entrepreneurs have that VCs stole my company. What VCs are really looking at is, what you don't understand is you were seeing one venture capitalist every six weeks or whenever you held board meetings. What you didn't understand is they're sitting on eight to 12 boards and when they pulled up to your parking lot, they had to look up your name until today. They might have had some valuation for you in their, in, in, in their plans, but really you were worth zero. But today you're no longer worth zero. In fact, you were worth a lot of money potentially. But now I want to understand whether the same executive who found the business for me is the one to grow it. And the secret is that the transition is founders tend to leave. And the first question I now tell my entrepreneurs, and so is one of the VCs. Um, and so, <laughs> he's updating the memo right now. <laughs> um, so one of the things I ask my entrepreneurs, just ask VCs, tell me, tell me, what percentage of your portfolio CEOs have gone from search all the way to grow? It varies. Some firms are actually absolutely great at building founders further on. Others hire operating executives right here at the transition. And by the way, from their point of view, it's not only not stupid, it actually makes lots of sense. It's more work to teach you guys how to actually have skills that you didn't probably have. You actually have all the skills on the left. And you ought to understand, none of this is personal, right? But it's a secret memo that you ought to all understand now. And I go around the valley actually telling people this and it makes everybody kind of vibrate. But you just ought to understand, it's just business. Your job is to find a repeatable and scalable business model. So this stuff is in the Startup Owner's Manual. This book we were talking about, not here to flack the book, but just to show you what we were talking about is stuff on the left, and we want to get you to stuff on the right, which is execution. So how does this work? I got to tell you, I did eight startups in 21 years, everything from consumer software to video games to whatever. Um, and by the way, eight, out of those uh, eight startups, four of them went public. But the most interesting things were, were I had two craters so deep they left their own iridium layer. I mean, that's, that's how bad I screwed it up. Um, you know, I, I lost $35 million on one of them, and I had to call my mother and said, Mom, I lost $35 million. And she said, well, where'd you put it? <laughs> I, I, I said, no, 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 no. Mom, I, it's like spent. <laughs> And my mom and my whole family were immigrants to the United States. And, you know, she started muttering in Russian and then Polish and then Yiddish. And then <laughs> she said, are you going to jail? Do you have to pay it back? I said, no, no, mom. It's, you know, this is America. Oh, yes, America, we're great. Well, what do you do now? I said, well, the VCs just gave me $12 million to do the next company. And I heard thunk. <laughs> and it, luckily, it was just the phone she dropped. I thought she passed out. Um, which reminds us, in an entrepreneurial cluster... Do you know, that is where the culture is working. Do you know what we call a failed entrepreneur? What's the word? There's a special English word. Experienced. It's a big idea. You know you're in an entrepreneurial cluster where your failure is accepted, an honest failure, as part of the process. And the reason why I happen to be standing here is how from that $12 million, I returned a billion dollars each to the two VCs. And so then I retired. Um, but after I retired, and this is why I was telling you the story, I started teaching and realized that I didn't quite understand what the definition of a startup was. In fact, everybody seemed to have different definitions. And there was the Harvard one. It's about resources that you couldn't get. I said, you know what? Let me make one as an ex-startup CEO so I would know and my team would know what to do in the morning. Here's my definition. Number one is a startup is a temporary organization. That by itself is a big idea. There's no such thing as a 10-year-old startup. There's a two-year-old startup attached to an eight-year-old failure. Write that down, guys. Um, <laughs> right? It's not about bringing your dog in. It's not about the food. That camaraderie kind of confuses somebody or some people thinking that's the permanent state. That's not the permanent state. It's a temporary state. And it's an organization designed to search. That means you're not designed 
to write code, build hardware, get orders. You're designed to do all of that. But what you're doing is searching for something, and what you're searching for something is repeatable and scalable. You want to do the same thing on Monday that works on Wednesday. And you want, if I give you a dollar in, two dollars ought to come out ultimately. And so what you're searching for is a business model. This thing we pointed out earlier. A startup aims to become a company. And by the way, just as a reminder, so what's a business model? In theory, a business model is how you create value for yourself and your customers. And it has those nine boxes. Now, the nice thing is we could do all this planning. We could talk about what's our channel and who are our customer segments and what are the archetypes. But you realize, even when you're done doing all those plans, gee, here's a value prop, here's who I think my customers are, they're just hypotheses. Now, I have to tell you, when I teach at Stanford University, I use the word hypotheses a lot because the students pay $50,000 a year to go to school. And their parents want to hear that they're learning something important. So I use, well, we're learning about hypotheses. Do we know what the real word is? Guesses. Right? We're just guessing. <laughs> right? So, you know, even after we're done, we got this nice business model canvas and we went, well, wait a minute, how's this any better than a business plan, Steve? We just like spent 40 minutes, you know, and now you got us back to zero. And the reason why this is important is we now have an organizing principle. This takes about three hours. What I'm about to show you next takes months, if not years. That is, what we want to do is get out of the building, take our business model canvas hypotheses, our guesses, and change them into facts. And here's how we do that. We use customer development, this discovery and validation process, for getting out and repeatedly testing each one of our hypotheses. And the reality is most of them will be wrong. But instead of firing executives, or quote, not making the plan, we can now iterate and pivot in rapid succession. So the first thing you're doing is getting out and testing your assumption about the problem, and then you're testing the solution. And we're running a series of experiments, hypothesis, experiment, test, data, insight. It's a continuous loop of here's how I think they should behave, or here's who I think they are, and we're just running them cheaply and inexpensively. The other key idea, about customer development is a term coined by one of my students, Eric Reese. Anybody read the Lean Startup stuff? Uh, Eric was the best student I ever had, actually. So actually, almost 100% of the founders. It's a book you should have on yourself as well. Basically, Minimum Viable Product says, if you spec and build your entire feature set on day one, you're just simply going to be wrong. Right? So why don't you couple with an agile engineering process an agile customer search process? And that allows you to build product incrementally and iteratively based on continuous customer feedback. And most of the time, what you're going to find is that what your beliefs were about the product or who the segment is or about the channel is just simply wrong. It's simply wrong, but that's a normal part of startups. This is a huge concept because we used to believe that a normal part of startups is you wrote the plan, I gave you money for it, that's it, you're executing the plan. We now know after 50 years, why do we keep doing that? It doesn't work that way. What we want to have is a flexible process when hypotheses doesn't match reality, how do we quickly iterate or pivot? And my definition of a pivot is a substantive change to one or more of those business model canvas uh, hypotheses. I won't go through all the details, there's actually a process involved here in the Startup Owner's Manual. I want to just uh, show you one example. How does this really work? Uh, kind of like Startup Boot Camp, uh, we have a class that does this. It's probably not as good as the Startup Boot Camp process because the results are, are all here and pretty spectacular. Uh, we do it in eight weeks. The goal is 100 customer visits, not 100 survey monkey things. Watching people's pupils dilate. Now, the other thing is I mostly teach engineers uh, because uh, this process has not only been adopted at Stanford and Berkeley and Columbia and Caltech, the U.S. government this year has adopted it as the standard for teaching scientists and engineers who've gotten National Science Foundation grants who want to commercialize their technology. We'll teach uh, 175 teams this year, 375 next year, and then when we go online, we'll be teaching every scientist who gets a National Science Foundation grant, which is uh, uh, measured in the thousands. 
Now, unlike here, where you've managed to train these guys to be articulate and whatever, my definition of, of a win is teaching scientists uh, who believe the difference between an introvert and an extrovert is whether they're looking at their shoes or your shoes um, <laughs> on how to make eye contact. Just to, just to make eye contact. And you guys have already learned that process incredibly well. So let me wrap up. Um, does anybody notice that startups aren't typically run by accountants? Okay. Now, let me show you why. Um, and this will go quick. The inventor of uh, the modern corporation, at least in the US, anybody recognize this guy? Right. He looks kind of stern. His name was Alfred P. Sloan. Anybody recognize it now? Alfred P. Sloan was the president and chairman of General Motors kind of institutionalized divisionalization and corporate accounting in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, you know, he ran the, funded the Sloan Foundation. He was known in the 20th century in the United States as the Mr. Corporate. And General Motors actually was a well-respected company for the first 75 years in the United States. Except he wasn't the founder of General Motors. The founder of General Motors was this guy. Now, which guy would you rather hang out with? You know, this guy? <laughs> I mean, you know, if he had black eyes, you know, eye shades, you know, they would be like, yeah, he's the accountant. This guy's the entrepreneur. It's like you could have taken this picture in Palo Alto last week, right? His name was Billy Durant. Who? <laughs> Billy Durant had a great story. He was the leading horse cart manufacturer in a town called Flint, Michigan in the late 1800s. And he was doing great. So one day, he's sitting there drinking in Flint with his buddies in the horse cart business, and they hear what sounds like a series of explosions coming up the road. And it's the first horseless carriage. And his buddies are laughing hysterically. Look at that. That's never going to replace our carts and the horse. And they turn around, and Durant is gone. He sold his entire horse cart business and started buying up the highest tech companies in the United States at the time, automobile manufacturers. And Durant assembled a company called General Motors. Put together a series of brands, Buick, Cadillac, Oldsmobile. And because he was a crazy entrepreneur, he gets fired by the board in 1910. You're fired. In fact, they probably you know, got the memo too. Because <laughs> the board says, we'll run this like a company. And Billy Durant practiced the art of this. Because as an entrepreneur, keep the, this is your memo, he started a competing company called Chevrolet. Chevrolet grew larger than General Motors, bought up all the GM stock, and fired the board. <laughs> Durant comes back and runs the company for another five years. Grows General Motors in today's dollars as a founder to $3.6 billion until this time his new board fires him again. Durant my, uh, dies managing a bowling alley. Sloan dies rich honors and famous. You are here. And he is here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Sorry, it took so long. Well, that, uh, that was an inspiring talk. Um, good to know maybe that most of the teams pivoted several times and they are now right on track and uh, they will conquer the world. But thanks again, Steve.